We are uh, this week reading the final parsha of the second book of the Torah, the book of Shemais. At the end of each uh, book, we proclaim in Shul, Chazak, Chazak, Venis Chazik. Three times strong. Be strong, be strong, and let us be strengthened. So the conclusion of a book of Torah is literally um, not just a prayer for strength, but actually an increase in strength, which we identify and are uh, acknowledging by, by our proclamation of Chazak Chazak. We may have spoken about this once before. Uh, wh why is the Torah broken, divided into five books? We know that it's only one Torah, the Torah is unified, it is a single entity. We know there's only one Jewish people, meaning all Jews are united and a single entity. And we know that God is one, meaning not that there's not another God, but that there is nothing left out. Everything in the world and everything we know is all part of his plan, part of his vision, his, his creation. In many places in Hasidus, it explains very logically what the Baal Shem Tev, uh, stated, posited, that when we say God created the world, we don't mean that creation is over. God is creating the world constantly. It's a fundamental, a fundamental pr principle of the Baal Shem Tev's philosophy. Creation is a constant ongoing process. And the reason, very simple. The world was created out of nothing. There was nothing. God made existence exist. It is therefore impossible for the universe, the created universe, to go on on its own to continue existing without being created, like when a potter forms a pot out of clay. When he finishes making the pot, he can walk away, he can even leave town on a jet plane. And, and the pot that he created will remain. It will retain its shape and its function without the potter supporting it or uh, redoing it constantly, and that's because the potter was using clay that already existed, not out of nothing, and the clay already contained in its potential forms and shapes the form of a pot. So even the, uh, the new shape that the potter introduces is not created out of nothing, it already existed in potential, in the clay. For example, you can make a pot out of clay, you can't make a pot out of water. Water doesn't have the potential of retaining a shape. So nothing is new in the pot. And that's why the potter can walk away and the pot will continue to exist. But when God creates the world out of nothing, what is it that holds the existence if God stops existing it, causing it to exist. You can't teach nothing to be something, because nothing has no potential, and it can't learn any new tricks. Mm -hmm. So even after it's created, and it's existing and being recreated for 6,000 years, if, it, if God stops creating it, it goes back to absolute nothingness, because it learned nothing it retains nothing, it absorbed nothing, because nothing remains nothing. The Rebbe spoke about this, and again, this is mentioned so many times in, in various uh, Hasidic uh, discourses through all the generations, beginning with the Alta Rebbe. The Rebbe added a significant, interesting observation. The logic with which God created the world dictates that nothing cannot learn to be something. A something has the potential to be various shapes, various forms, 
But this rule, this principle, is part of creation. God created existence in such a way that something can retain a new shape and no thing cannot. So the question is, couldn't God have created a world with different principles? Couldn't God have created a world in which nothing can absorb and, and retain a shape? And if you would say, well, how, did, how, how was that logical? If that was the law of nature, it, it, it would be considered logical. The rules of nature that we have today, which we are so comfortable with and so familiar with, are in a sense arbitrary. That water flows downhill, that hot air rises, that gravity keeps things falling down. All of these things are inventions of God's plan. It could have been otherwise. It's the way it is for a particular reason, not because it couldn't be otherwise. Uh, you can go so far as saying that parents are usually older than their children. Safe assumption? <laughs> A pretty firm law of nature? Parents are older than their children. But even that happens to be the reality in which God places us. Had he made it otherwise, if children were older than their parents, we would simply say, it's a law of nature. It's the way it is. We would not complain, because we wouldn't know otherwise. So all of the laws of nature, even the most logical, like parents are older than their children, is not absolutely necessary. It's God's choice that this should be the logic, this should be the rule, this should be the nature. So the question is, what does it mean God needs to recreate the world every second constantly because the law of nature says that nothing can't learn to do something. Certainly God could have created a world that can maintain itself for whatever number of years without his constant involvement. So the Rebbe changed our appreciation of the entire existence of all of the universe and of our relationship with God by the simple observation. God created the world in such a way that it cannot exist without him even for a second so that he is constantly creating it because he wants to be constantly involved intimately with our existence, with our lives, with our, with our presence. So although this is a law in nature, but the law of nature is an expression of God's love and God's devotion to us. What it does for our view of the universe, if God is creating the world constantly, then it follows logically that he knows everything that's happening and is determining everything that is happening because at every moment he is creating the world. So divine providence, God's watching over us and being aware of what's going on. This is not something extra and additional to creating us. As he creates us, he knows us. He can never not notice anything because everything is happening because he's creating it now in real time. Very reassuring that there is not a second, not an event, not a movement of a leaf being carried from one side of the street to the other, that God is not aware of because he is actively involved in making it happen. Because if he doesn't make it happen, it don't happen. So now when we look at nature, you look at the universe, you see a cow chewing grass, you see grass. What are you looking at? What are you seeing? You're seeing the constant miracle of creation. The cow has no business chewing its cud or chewing the grass. The grass has no business growing. Not, neither of them have any business existing. Because if, if for the second God stops saying, let there be grass, there is no grass. 
It does not exist on any level whatsoever. So why is there grass? Because God's word, God's instruction is functional. When God says, let there be, there be. So the cow chewing the grass and the grass itself and the earth on which it's standing, it's all responding to God's command. That's what it's doing. The cow is not just a cow. It's a response to God's command, be a cow. Let there be cows. Let there be grass. Let there be an earth. Let there be water. So what are we seeing? We are seeing the behavior of a cow that obeys and follows God's command. And it's not just the totality of the cow, it's every detail. That the cow chews grass, it doesn't hunt. That's being created constantly every second. Because by saying, let there be cow, the cow wouldn't know what to do. What's a good cow? So when God says, let there be a cow, he means every detailed description of what a cow is, how it works, how it's built, how it functions, what it eats, what it does, what it thinks. So cow is just a uh, formula, like a mathematical formula, for this very complex creature. And that's why when the Jews made the golden calf and God was angry, Moshe made a strange argument. And the Medrash marvels. How did he get away with it? Moshe said to God, why are you angry at your people? Which is a rather bold statement. And God said, 40 days ago, I told them not to make graven images. And here they're, they're bowing to a cow. And Moshe said, is it so terrible to show a little appreciation for a cow? It gives milk. In those days, people drank milk. <laughs> Lactose intolerance had not yet been invented. So is it so terrible to show a little appreciation for the milk? So God said, these are his words. You too, Moshe? You're making the same mistake? Cows don't make milk. I make the milk, and I make the cow, and I put the milk in the cow. The cow is nothing. So Moshe said, so what are you angry about? They're bowing to nothing. And although that sounds like a nasty little trick set up, Moshe was so sincere about it, that it not only was accepted and he got away with it, but it actually brought forgiveness to the people. So to understand, what, what was Moshe saying? He says, why are you angry? Because they bow to a cow. A cow is useful. In the functional level, on the visible level, a cow gives milk. Without a cow, we have no milk. So what's so terrible of recognizing the function of the cow and the uh, contribution that the cow makes to human life? If, on the other hand, you're going to tell me a cow doesn't do anything, a cow is a response to my command, I say, let there be cow, so there's cow. I say, let there be milk, so there's milk. If that's the case, then they're bowing to nothing. Why would you be angry about that? Well, maybe bowing to nothing is offensive. When you have a king, and instead of bowing to him, you bow to nothing, is that not offensive? So it must be that Moshe was saying, if in fact the cow is nothing, other than your creation constantly being conjured, constantly being brought from nothingness into existence, then what they're bowing to essentially is you, because the cow is nothing. So when we say the cow is nothing, we don't mean it doesn't exist. We mean it has no existence of its own. It's simply you doing your thing. You make a cow, you make milk. So if they're bowing to the cow in appreciation for the milk, they're essentially bowing to you. It's only if you make the mistake and attribute volition to the cow. You're grateful to the cow for the milk because if the cow was in a bad mood, he wouldn't give milk, he wouldn't produce milk. Well, that's idolatry. But if they're not doing that, if they realize that the cow itself is nothing, it's all you're doing, then, then essentially they're bowing to you. So we walk out into nature. 
What are you seeing? What are you experiencing? If you tune in properly, you're seeing an entire universe of obedience to God's instruction. The cow goes about being a cow because that's what it's being told to do. The grass grows because that's what it is told to do. The sun rises, the sun sets because it's told to do that. The wind blows, the leaves fall, the tree blossoms. All of it, all of it is an orchestra responding to the conductor's instructions. Only in this case, the instructions involve existence itself. Amazingly, in recent times, the, the scientists uh, have come to a, a recognition and to a definition of what exactly is the world. If you ask the scientists today, what is, what is this made of? What is this? In the olden days, they would say cheap plastic. <laughs> plastic. What is plastic? Plastic is a compound made up of molecules. What are molecules? A collection of atoms. What is an atom? An atom is the ultimate substance from which everything is created. More recently than that, they discovered that the atom is not the ultimate mineral. It has parts too. It is, it is composed of parts. There are subatomic particles. So there's an electron. Ah, so what is an electron? And they keep going like this to tinier and tinier substances, trying to figure out what is the original substance from which all else derives. Well, they've come to a new realization. There is no substance. It is literally correct to say there is no such thing called electron. Electron is an observable behavior. There's activity going on in the atom, and that's called an electron. This activity, this behavior, what's doing it? The answer is nothing. There's just the behavior. When you see behavior consistently, and it becomes a habit to expect that behavior, then you tend to identify it as a thing. In other words, a behavior pattern eventually starts to take on a mass or a substance. But originally, it was just the behavior. What was behaving? It's not an object that has a behavior. It's a behavior that is consistent enough to identify as a thing. Does sound a little mystical? Actually, it's saying exactly the same thing that the Torah says. There is no electron. God said, let there be electrons, so the behavior of an electron happened. Not an object called electron. So the entire universe and everything in it is simply the behavior that is respo a response to God's instruction. So when God said, let there be light, he didn't create a thing. He created the behavior of light. So the Torah says, the universe is simply a behavior in response to God's instruction. And today, the scientists are saying the same thing. There is no object. There's only the behavior. On the surface, of course, we see an object. But under the surface, even to the, even to the uh, trained eye, the object disappears under the microscope, under the atomic microscope. The object disappears, and all we see is behavior. It's an amazing universe. Everything in the universe obeys God's instruction constantly, without exception, perfectly, without a flaw. Only the human being, the smartest of them all, is not always responding to God's instructions. We have freedom of choice. And we have urges and thoughts and opinions of our own that um, are not always consistent with God's will. So we are the exception to the, to the, in the universe. We are the only creatures, the only creations that are not absolutely loyal to our, to our creator. And that's why being out in nature is so 
inspiring. It puts us in touch with our own innocent self, makes us feel like we are also a response to God's instruction, let us make man. And it inspires us to behave accordingly, to be true to our truest nature. So if the cow is always a cow and the grass is always grass, why, why can't the Jew always be a Jew? I don't mean in fact, I mean in behavior. So are we the worst part of creation? Or we are the best part of creation? All of creation, that were all, everything created in the first six days of creation, were created only so that we would have a venue, a world in which we can make choices. Sometimes the right ones, sometimes the wrong ones. So when we walk out in nature and we're inspired, that's what nature was created for, to inspire us to do the right thing. Because when we do the right thing, that is the purpose of creation. So it's a beautiful world, but nature itself is not the purpose. The purpose is to have people who have freedom of choice, who will by their own conviction, by their own energy, and by their own choice, choose to be loyal to every commandment and every instruction that God gives. So we read in the Parsha, the last Parsha of Shmos, an entire Parsha that simply says, and the Jews did what they were commanded to do. With all the details. They put together the, they, they put together the boards and they put together the gold and they wove the, the weavings and they, they did everything that we were told to do in the previous Parsha. Would it not have been sufficient to say one sentence instead of a whole parsha and simply say and all of that they did but the torah repeats every detail they made the the the, 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 the curtains and they made the hooks and they made because that's a description of reality when we are acting so consistent with god's instruction then we are the ultimate blessing of all of nature the ultimate of all of creation then we are greater than the cow that is always a cow and greater than the grass that is always grass and the ocean that is always oceaning. But when we do out of our freedom of choice exactly what God instructs us to do without embellishing, without dropping details, without getting lazy, that justifies the existence of the cow and the existence of the grass and the existence of the ocean pretty heavy task to put on a human being. So how are we doing? Chief Rabbi of Israel, years ago, the then Chief Rabbi of Israel, was visiting with the Rebbe. And they spoke about different things, problems in Israel and the world. And the Chief Rabbi said, Rebbe, what's going to be? And the Rebbe said, rather than asking what's going to be, ask what more can we do? What's going to be is not a frightening question. Like he said, Rebbe, what's going to be? And the answer is so negative that the Rebbe changed the subject and said, no, never mind. Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about what we can do. The opposite is true. What's going to be? Mashiach is going to come. The world is going to become perfect. The world will become godly. Exactly what God intends and exactly what God wants, that's what's going to be. So we can retire. We can all go to sleep. The reason we want to do what we are commanded to do is not because we're worried about what's going to be. What's going to be is like saying, will God succeed? Yes, God will succeed, but we don't want him to succeed without us. We don't want to see God succeed while standing at the sidelines. That's not what we're here for. We are here to think every day, what more can I do to make the good things happen that are going to happen without a doubt? Does that take some of the motivation away? You know, if it's going to be good in the end anyway, what am I worried about? So fine, I'll do whatever I can do, but there's no urgency. As if all urgency comes from fear, from tragic possibilities. That is so negative. We are not motivated by fear. You know, if we don't get our act together, it's going to be a disaster. It's going to, you know, the end is near. It's all, that doesn't motivate good behavior. That motivates selfish behavior, self-preservation behavior. So anytime you hear someone speaking that way, 
It's all going bad. It's all going to be terrible. Another year of this, another 10 years, and it's all going to be over, and it's all going downhill, and it's all going to... That's, that's not how you motivate people. That's how you abuse people. You force them into whatever activity you choose by scaring them, threatening them, depressing them. Not nice. Totally unnecessary. We are purposeful creatures created with an inborn natural sense of mission and purpose. We want to fulfill that purpose. You don't need to scare me. Just tell me what it is. Show me how it's done. Don't threaten me. Because again, if you threaten me, I will be highly motivated, but not for my mission. I'll be highly motivated by self-preservation, survival of the fittest. That's not my mission. My mission is to be a partner with God. Not that God needs a partner. He can do it all by himself. But he asked us to be his partner. He created us to be his partner. He programmed us to be his partner. So all I need is to show me how, tell me what. I already want to do it. That's what being purposeful means. In fact, I can't stand not having a purpose. It drives me crazy. I'm here for no reason. I would never accept that. I couldn't. So you have to scare me? No, you don't. So that's the Lebe's approach. Don't ask what's going to be. Ask what more we can do to fulfill our mission, not to avoid tragedy. God forbid. So upwards and onwards. What more can we do to make the world a godlier place? And part of the motivation and the urgency is that Moshiach is coming. So if you don't do something soon, your contribution will no longer be necessary. That's a scary thought. The world is going to become good without you. That's scary. So what did I do? So what happened to my mission? That's motivation enough. If you enjoyed this conversation or this topic, and you're looking for more information, or you want to hear it again from another angle, there is a way to do that, and that is in this book. It's all there. Order it from Amazon. You can read it, reread it, and share it. I want to invite you to join us as VIPs, partners in our work, and join us also for uh, a personal chat with other members of the VIP club. We talk about many things. There's an opportunity to ask, to respond, to make a comment, to meet the other supporters. And together we can really make a difference in Jewish life and in life in general. So join us. It's goodtoknow.org. Log in, call, make contact and join us with the VIPs.